Well, it's good to be able to welcome people from wider than this room to join in this service at this point. Welcome, and uh, as I said before, one day we look forward to when we will meet together. We meet here at 10.30, so that's uh, on a Sunday, so that's perhaps a good clue as a time when we could meet together. And we can see you as well as you seeing us. We will have the communion during the service, and uh, if you want to participate uh, and you haven't got anything there just yet, pause the button. Just pause it for a moment. Get your bread, get something to drink, and when we share in the communion, you can share too. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we are conscious that in Christ alone our hope is found. Christ is our light, our strength, our song. And we thank you, dear Lord and Heavenly Father. Here is a cornerstone, the cornerstone that is spoken of in the Scriptures. And we pray, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, that during this time together, may we discover what it is to be joined together, built together, and built together on the foundation of Jesus. And so we pray this in your namesake. Amen. Amen. I want to read a few verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, here is where Paul writes of the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, and reveals to us something of what it's all about. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and from verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he'd given thanks he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so then, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Everyone ought to examine themselves. So it's not about looking at somebody else and saying, here, you shouldn't be. It's about looking at ourselves and saying, am I ready? Am I prepared? Am I? Let's uh, ask for the Lord's blessing upon the bread and upon the wine. Lord and Heavenly Father, we, we pray for your blessing upon the, the elements we're about to share just now. We pray that as we eat the bread, may we be reminded, here is a reminder of the body of Christ that was broken for us on the cross of Calvary. As we drink the wine, may we be reminded of the blood of Christ spilt for us on the cross of Calvary. As we partake, may we be reminded that here we are proclaiming what you have done for us, how you have made it possible. And in the midst of it, may you bless the bread, may you bless the wine, may you bless the elements that we share together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, say, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Let's eat. Likewise with the wine, Jesus said, This is the blood of the new covenant. Take and drink in remembrance of me. Possibly a month, three weeks to four weeks, as a church, uh, we have been praying for the situation in U the Ukraine. Uh, and as also as a church, we have sought to see how we can how we can discover practical ways in which we can be supportive of the people in Ukraine. And we have during that time um, uh, seen four hundred pound that's been. Uh, collected and sent to BMS so that they may be able to support Ukraine. And we continue to do that. But so that we can get some understanding, more understanding, uh, we've got a um, presentation here which you, uh, we'll be able to see on the screen here and it will be something to help us in our prayer time. I'll read it through in case there's anybody that's not able to see the writing and uh, you can read it, you can listen. Pray for Ukraine and its neighbours. We are experiencing the worst refugee crisis since the Second World War. And yet, so many of our brothers and sisters remain in Ukraine. So please join us in prayer. Thank you for standing alongside all those affected by the conflict who pray and long for peace. Today we pass on prayers from our partners on the ground in Ukraine. We have a picture here of Pastor Iger Bandura, Vice President of the Baptist Union of Evangelical Ukrainian Churches. At a recent prayer gathering, Iger shared from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, explaining that Ukrainian Baptists... Well, <laughs> please pray that God will give his supernatural power through the Holy Spirit, as it is all bigger than what we and our Ukrainian brothers and sisters can manage. Please pray for those trapped in churches in occupied cities, that even as they are surrounded by enemies, God would surround them with Christian love and care. Please pray that peace 
will reign in you king. For those fleeing, please pray for their safe passage, for welcoming arms and for hot food. Please pray that churches will be able to minister to all. Pray that the church leaders will know the guidance and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for uniting in prayer. Thank you so much for all your prayerful support. Together we can help show Christ's love for those who need it most. Picture of the Baptist Church in Ukraine there. Finding all the latest updates from BMS World Mission on our website. And I'm sure you will discover so all that information on the website. My apologies for not reading fast enough. I am reminded of somebody who wrote me a letter many years ago, many years ago, and the person was showing a bit of humour and they said, Dear John, I am writing this letter very slowly because I know you do not read very fast. But whether we read slow or whether we read fast, I think we're all conscious that there's a great need there in Ukraine and we need to pray. So we've been praying, we've been looking at ways in which we can financially give money. There may well be other ways in which we might need to, we should be looking at uh, how we can support the people of Ukraine and those who are leaving Ukraine at this moment. Some people are coming as far as England, as far as the UK. And uh, here in Perry, we need to continue to pray, as I'm sure those on the internet will be. We need to continue to pray. How can we be supportive in a reasonable and a practical way? Uh, the government uh, have made suggestions about if you've got a spare room, can you give up a room? They will give some financial support to that. Um, there's a lot of practical reasons why our own building here just would not be suitable uh, to house them here. But as a church, maybe there's ways in which we can support people who are finding they've got a room they can share. And we like to do that. So uh, let's pray about that, how we as a church may be able to be supportive. Now, you can think of ways. I'm quite sure of that. Please let us know what those ways are. Maybe it's about letting, taking the folks out for a day, letting them see something of this wonderful countryside that surrounds us here in Perry. Let them see why it is. We're such an important place, Perry. That's why we've got a postcode, P-E, which stands for Perry. <laughs> well, some people think it stands for Peterborough, but we know it stands for Perry. It's an important place. Maybe that's, that's one way in which we can be supportive. But do, do please talk with us, share with us how that may be possible, that we can, in Christian love, be a support to those who may be coming to this locality. Uh, I don't know how many of us here have got spare rooms, and I'm not going to make any survey on that, you know, uh, whether that's a possibility or not. Um, but uh, uh, if there is anybody uh, who makes that decision, please let us know if we can help, if we can support you through this time. Brenda's now going to bring to us a reading from God's Word. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, we're reading from Exodus 3, verse 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. 
When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses, Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have, seen, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Thank you, Brenda, for sharing with us God's Word. Some of you who have been regularly um, listening in will be aware that we've been looking at, we had been looking at Colossians and working our way through Colossians. But we are taking a break during this period called Lent and we'll come back to Colossians after Easter. And so I want us just to look today at this chapter from Exodus. Because during the period of Lent, you know, we are being reminded that there's a challenge that lies ahead. There is a challenge. And in the 40 days, we need to be asking ourselves, are we ready for the challenge? Are we ready for the challenge? And uh, you know, as, we, as we come towards the end, we see what a great what a tremendous challenge that is there. When Jesus is on the cross of Calvary, what a challenge. It's a challenge, yes, for Jesus to be able to come to that point and say, yes, not my will, but my Father's will. It's a challenge. When someone says, didn't you, how much do you love me? And he, Jesus can say, I love you that much. I love you that much. I spread my hands upon the cross of Calvary, but a challenge for us, a challenge of the cross, a challenge of the resurrection, a challenge that we might respond to where he calls us, to where he calls us. The big question is, are we listening to the call? Are we listening to the call? There's a challenge. There are challenges in the passage that Brenda read for us. The challenges are these. There's a challenge of the call of God. Are you listening to the call of God? Are you listening for his challenge when he says, come? 
Are you listening for his challenge when he says go? Are you listening to his challenge when he says stay put where you are? I've got to work for you here, now, today. And then move on. And then move on. So we see that call of God that's here for Moses. And it's God's initiative. You ever notice that when there's a call? It's God's initiative, not ours. It's not us saying to, to God, God, we think this would be a good idea. What about it? What do you think? It's God is saying, this is my call for you. This is my initiative. Moses is just doing his work. He's tending to the flock of his father-in-law. It's just an ordinary working day for him. But in the midst of the ordinary working day, God interrupts and God brings to him that challenge, that challenge of a call. But it was God's initiative. God's initiative and it's God's miracle. God's initiative and it's God's miracle. There's a burning bush here. And the bush just doesn't seem to go out. Have you ever seen it, such a thing as that? A bush is burning and it keeps on burning and burning and burning. And we never come to that point when it all comes to an end. It continues to burn. I want you to think about this because that burning bush without the fire of God within it is only a bush. That's all. It's only a bush. But it's more than a bush because the fire of God was within it. And the fire of God is something that is continuously there. The fire of God is what will take us without ceasing. When the fire of God is in our lives, we know what it is. We experience what it is. To know there's a God who says, trust me, I will take you all the way. It's not going to peter out all the way. So there we have it, the call of God. It's God's initiative. It's God's miracle. When God calls you, it is a miracle. And you know, it is a miracle. It is a miracle. Why should God call me? Why should God call me? You can sense something of Moses. Uh, we, th we can see it as an excuse. He talks about things like, I, I stutter and all those kind of things if we were to read on to our later verses. He's got a lot of excuses, but hang on a minute. Let me just put it into perspective. Here is Moses, 80 years of age. And Moses says, uh, but why me? Now, anybody who's approaching, well, I know, ladies, you're never going to be approaching 80 years of age, are you? But can you imagine that? You're 80 years of age and God says, I'm calling you for a specific work. And you perhaps can identify now with Moses. I'm 80 years of age. Lord, why are you calling me? Why don't you call somebody else? Why don't you call somebody younger? But God says, I'm calling you, Moses. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. It's a miracle that God can do that. And yet, throughout the ages, God has been doing just that. Just that. When we see and recognize the challenge of the call of God. He's calling even you and even me. And his call isn't about what are your abilities. His call isn't about how youthful you are. God, from the very beginning, has no doubt been looking upon each one of us and saying, now, if that person responds, here's a wonderful thing that that person can do when I call him, when I call her. A great thing. And it's all part of God's call, God's initiative, and God's miracle in our lives today. We come with our imperfections. We all do. I do. We come with our imperfections. But therein is a miracle that God will use even us, even us. There's a call of God. That's a challenge. But the challenge also is for us to be consistent in our response. We need to listen. 
We need to learn and then we need to go. We need to listen. We need to listen. And for all the excuses we may say that Moses puts up, look at this character Moses. Uh, he sees this burning bush. And so Moses thought, that's a funny thing. I think I'll go over there and I'll see what this strange sight is. See why the bush doesn't burn up. He responds to the challenge that's been placed before him. It's only God that could have done that strange, miraculous event. And so he goes over and he hears the voice of God saying, Moses, Moses. And what does Paul say? So what does Moses say? Here I am. Here I am. Jonah heard the call of God. Jonah heard the call of God. God called him to go to Nineveh. And instead of saying, here I am, what does Jonah say? Uh, I think I'll go the other way. He went the complete opposite direction to Tarshish. Instead of going east, he went west. Set sail on a ship. But Moses, he listened. He learned what it was all about. And when it comes to the end of it all, yes, he does go. In his frailty, in his weakness, in his imperfections, he goes. I know conscious, I, yeah, I can recognize something of where Paul is saying, I've, that what Moses is saying. I, I've not quite reached 80 yet. But... I do know there was a time when I would have said, I can't, I can't. There's a time when I would have said, I can't, I can't go into ministry. And I can list all the reasons why I couldn't do it. I could do that. I did do that. But there comes a point when we have to say, well, I come with my imperfections and I lean upon my perfect God. And he will take us forward. And he will. He will. The third challenge. The challenge of the call of God. There's a challenge for us to be consistent and to respond. But there's a challenge for us to have confidence in who God is. Who God is. You ever wondered why it is that, that God says, take off your shoes, this is holy ground? You ever wondered that? There's a sense in which it's holy ground. Any ground is holy because it's the Lord's. But there is a sense in which this is the place I'm calling, giving the call to you. This is where I'm present with you. And you need to recognize the holiness. But why take off your shoes? Why take off your shoes? Not so long ago, not so many years ago, I can't remember the exact year, but some of you will. When they came to the fall of Iraq, and you remember the statue of the president of Iraq was being dismantled. Do you remember seeing on the television screens those people taking off their shoes and with the sole of their shoe, they hit at the statue. Now the shoe's not going to do a lot. But in the culture, it did everything. Because that was a symbol of offence. And so here we are, in whole, on holy ground. A place in which there should be no offence to God. And on this holy God, ground, we want to show our respect to the God who's called us. So we don't necessarily need to take our shoes off. But we do need to come as people who have a respect for God. We recognize who he is, who he is in this holy place as he speaks to us. To respect him as we hear his word. To respect him as we speak with him in prayer. To respect him. We need to have confidence in who God is. And as we speak with God, we're speaking with the God who is 
above everything. Who are you, Lord? I am. And everybody knew exactly what we're talking about. I am. Nothing exists except for I am. I am. Confidence in who God is. For we have a consistent Lord. We've got a Lord who is consistent. And we need to be consistent in our knowledge of the Lord. All of that. In all of that. Some years ago, Charles Heston uh, starred in a film called Ben-Hur. Any of you seen Ben-Hur? Okay, well they, they spent a long time trying to do all of the work, including lots of extras to stand in, as they do, because the actors can't do everything. But Ben-Hur, not Ben-Hur, but Charles Heston, who was playing Ben-Hur, he looked on and saw what was going on, and he thought, I'll have a go at trying to ride in these chariots. And so he practiced, and he practiced, and he practiced. And eventually he said to the producer, he says, I, I can ride a chariot, but I don't know whether I could win the race, the chariot race. Well, said the producer, don't worry about that. As long as you can keep in the chariot, we'll make sure you win the race. You see, it's scripted that way. That's the way the script is. And you know, as long as we can keep in the knowledge of who our Lord is, as long as we are consistent with our Lord, as long as we are with him, the script is there. I don't know whether I can manage it, but I'm going to keep in the chariot. I'm going to keep in the chariot. I'm going to keep in the Lord. And if we keep in the Lord, just as it was for Charles Heston and keeping in the chariot, so it is for us keeping in with the Lord. The script is written. He will see us through. We're trusting him. We're trusting him. And he is able. More than able. So we come to the end of it all. And what then? What then? God says to Moses, he says, listen, I'm calling you to go into Egypt. I'm calling you to bring out the people, your people from Egypt. But it doesn't end there because there's kind of come a time when you will come out into the spot where you are now, traveling through the wilderness. And as you come to the spot, come and worship the Lord, our God. And as we respond to the call God's given, you know, the great things that lie before us only because of him. Are we prepared to say, Lord, you are the reason I worship you. I worship you alone. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about me. It was about my God. It was about my God. I want to say thank you, Lord. For your call, for your leading. How's God calling you? I'm not asking what age you are. I'm not asking whether you're too old or too young. How's God calling you? Is he calling you in the sense of the call of the cross? Is he calling you in the sense that Jesus died on the cross for you at Calvary? Is he calling you in the sense that he, that death he gave to his life. In the midst of taking on the sin of the world, he gave to us freedom. Freedom. Is he calling you in respect to that? Is he calling you as he called Paul? Remember when Paul went through the, uh, went to Damascus, and there he had a, 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 he had a meeting with Jesus. Can you imagine that? It changed him completely. And he went to that street called Straight and met with a man called Ananias. And there, as he met with Ananias, as he met with Ananias, he began to discover the most wondrous call he could know in his life. He was called to be a Christian. He was called to be a follower of Christ. They didn't use the word Christian at that time, historically. He was 
one of the people of the way because he trusted Jesus as Saviour. He was all of that. But the Lord was saying at that point, I have called you. Not to go with the, with the authority of the rulers of this earth, but to go with the authority of our Heavenly Father. To go as far as you can in this world, even into Rome, and to there share the good news. God loves you. God cares for you. God has brought a wondrous story that brings to us grace and hope. And hope beyond all measure. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, may we indeed come having faced the challenge, having accepted the challenges and living with the challenges. When we come with that realisation, you will not fail us. But you will take every step with us, every step of the way. And so we commit these words of our Lord unto you. May they be committed in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So thanks for those who joined us on the internet. So pleased that you were able to join with us. Look forward to sharing with you another time.